Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. I am absolutely delighted and thrilled to bring you back someone who's been on the show recently and has been hugely, hugely valuable to, to the Harrington style business, James Gorman from Biome. James, how are you? Morning, Toby. Very well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks again for having me once again. Well, listen, it's good to have you back. You're going to be a regular on the show, I can tell. For those of you who haven't seen the first uh, first episode, James has been absolutely brilliant at helping us uh, working as a business with our tiny habits. We'll be talking a little bit more about that a little bit later on, but uh, the whole world of well-being is something there which I think has been uh, more and more put onto the scene as, as the pressures of modern day life and everything that's been happening in, in the macroeconomic and, and news over the last uh, couple of years has, has come more and more to the fore. James is here to be the salvation for everyone. James, tell us a little bit about yourself again. Sure. Yeah, I um, I was a former investment banker. So I did that for about 15 years. I had various health problems, which I finally figured out were probably at least partly caused by the choices I was I was making. So I eventually decided to do something about that, which included getting out of that that career as well. Uh, and I went back to uh, went back to school, went back to university to, to study um, health sciences, nutrition, particularly more more formally initially an attempt to, to help my myself to figure out how to make myself better which of course is an ongoing ongoing process and after that decided that I wanted to try and help you know people that were either in my position or, or, or close to, to getting to that point to, to take better better care of themselves to help companies take better care of their employees generally I'm using the skills that I'd, I'd learned with myself, but also more formally to, to, to do that. And as we talked about before, in doing this, this business, BioMe, for a couple of years, in the, in the sort of run-up to lockdown, the, and the, the initial feedback was great, and we were doing our, our three pillars, which are nutrition and movement and sleep, eat, move, sleep. Mm-hmm. And we thought we had the best researched advice out there, and I really believe we did, and it was all very well received. But I was worried that not many people were actually doing anything with it. <laughs> and I think that was the problem. They liked it and they thought, wow, this is different. This is good. It's cleared up some of the confusion around these complex topics. I now know what I need to do. How many people actually went away and did it, I think is a lot smaller than I, I really wanted to, to, to think about. But we, we, we had to, to, to rethink it because when I started this business, I, I wanted it to work. I wanted it to do what it said on the tin. I wanted it to improve people's well-being. If, if they don't make any changes, then nothing's going to happen. Absolutely. And so I, I really took it completely back to the drawing board and said, how do we actually help people change? And that's when I retrained once again in, in behavior change, in, in habits. And that's really become the leading edge of what we what we do now. The, the foundational lifestyle stuff is still eat, move and sleep. They're still the most important areas to focus on. But it's really habit change that, that's the driver to actually help people put this stuff into practice to help people actually make improvements and to help companies actually make their well-being strategy work. Because I'm increasingly believing that unless a corporate well-being strategy is actively helping people change their habits, then it's probably not working very well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so so important, isn't it? Because you, you're absolutely right that, that you, you go through uh, areas... Yeah, you know, we were talking before you know, coming on air about books and, and how you know we read things and we and we look to improve it and say right yeah there's loads of great action and th- and thoughts and processes and then life gets in the way and everything that you wanted to implement from reading those books it just doesn't necessarily happen. And I love the way that what you're doing and, and what you did with the team is about making sure you break that down so something which is a a mountain just becomes another step further forward, right? And that, and, and and I think that's something which is really powerful to making sure that this isn't just about a session, a platitude that we're ticking the box of, of, of talking about well-being or wellness or whatever it is like that. This is about something making sustainable, and I think sustainable is a really important word, sustainable change in things, which comes down to the power of habit. Now, we've spoken about this uh, a fair amount between the pair of us as well, and I've always been a big believer in, in building habits you know through habit trackers or through various different ways and it's been a part of my life for many many years and i see it in individuals uh, you know across the industry our industry across the fintech space where people sort of go on to um want to make change and they do various bits and pieces and when they don't get that immediate feedback when they don't get those, those immediate wins it's where it breaks and and you know i guess it's the same as any new year's resolution or lengths that fail or whatever whatever it may be there's lots of experiences and examples of where that happens but through the power of, of habit, I know you think that's a, a great way of, of creating sustainable change in all areas of, of, of your well-being. Tell us a little bit about that, James. Yeah, there are, there are 
a couple of things to, to think about. The first one is, and you sort of alluded to this, which is, and this is the mistake we made, I think, in, in starting this business, was it was all about telling people what they should do. It was all about saying, you should do this and here's why, convincing them to, to, to do something. And of course, we don't tend to do things that we think we should do, or especially things that other people think we should do. We do things that we want to do. Mm-hmm. So there's a real sort of change in mindset there, which is focus on the things you actually want to do, not the things you think you should do or the things other people think you should do. Start with the things you want to do. You can get to the other things later, but always start with the things you want to do. And usually, you know, there's loads of stuff we all want to do that we never get around to doing or, or we can never make sustainable. And one of the main reasons for that is they're, they're often just too big. They're often just too hard, even though we don't think they, are, they appear hard. And so, as you said, it's about sort of breaking them down into their smallest possible version and, and building consistency around it. The example I, I give, and we talked about this on the session we had with, with Harry Starr, it's about cleaning your teeth. Mm. It's a good one because people clean their teeth, teeth often, so they, they sort of get the, uh, get the message. Nobody, in keeping their teeth clean, waits for a whole month, and then at the end of the month, kind of launches oh, two hours of, you know, frenetic toothbrushing. Now, of course, we don't do that. It seems obvious. But the reasons we don't do that, I think, are twofold. One is we'd never do it, would we? So you yeah. get to the end of the month and you're faced with this sort of two hours of, of, of brushing on a, on a Sunday. You know, you'd already made plans that day. You certainly wouldn't have the motivation to do it. Maybe you'll manage a token effort of five or 10 minutes if, you, if you're really working at it. You're never going to do two hours. Most of the time, you're probably not even going to start. But the other reason is it wouldn't be very effective either. So you start hacking away at, you know, a month's worth of plaque buildup on your, on your teeth. It's going to be, a, you know, pretty futile exercise. <laughs> so you're not going to do it. But even if you did do it, it wouldn't be effective. And of course, what you do and what our dentists have always you know, recommended that we do is brush our teeth for about two minutes twice a day. You're still brushing for two hours every month, but by breaking it down into tiny things to do every day, one is you, you do it and you do it consistently. You know, I, I might miss a toothbrushing session, I don't know, once every couple of months, but more or less without fail, it happens twice a day. And as we know, it's very effective. Doing a little bit every day is the best way to keep your teeth clean. Now, if you think about most of the other things we do in life, you can kind of follow that that analogy. You know, if we break them down into small, particularly daily habits, or at least very frequent habits, we're more likely to do them, and they're more likely to be effective over time as the the benefits accumulate. Exercise is another great example meditation is one that I've kind of been you know really trying with over the last few years and and only now am I starting to see kind of the the benefits creeping in after having done a tiny bit I don't do it every day I try to tiny bit every day for a long period of time so yeah breaking it down is is really important for those two two reasons so I think it's a question for people to ask is of all these things I want to do why am I not doing them usually it's because they're too big and they're too hard and we just don't have the motivation at that point in time to do that big thing that we've set ourselves to do it could also be that we don't have a good prompt a good reminder to do it because that's important as well but most of the time it's because it's too big i think that's a really interesting point isn't it and, and look your, your, the session you did with the, with the, with the team is is been fascinating the follow-up with it i can talk uh, from from my experience on that which was uh you know, building up into the habit of stretching a little bit more and allowing myself to, you know, to, to be more mobile. And it was the thing there of, of what was the prompt that allowed me just to sort of do that one thing every single morning that then allowed the, the habit to build around that. And I'm still doing that now, what, three, four weeks after, after we went through and did that. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a change and it's a tiny, tiny little thing that then allows you know, the stuff to follow after it. And I think if you're saying, right, okay, make sure you, you know, for, for a long time, it was like do that every single day. It'll be, I'll get to that tomorrow, I'll do it later on or wherever it goes like that. But it's that that, that trigger, I think, is really, it was really impressive. And I know that other people in the team are also you know, coming through that and reaping the benefits significantly in their lives of, of doing the same thing as well. So this is stuff that is actionable and works. And I guess that's a really important part for, for everything you've just said there about the, the business there was well-researched, had great science to it. 
was putting things out there. This, this to me is, is a metaphor for every, every aspect of life, right? You can have the best strategy and plan, but if it is unattainable to get to that sort of strategy and plan, it goes off the, the radar very, very quickly. And that big, hairy, audacious goal that just disappears because you're busy. You're busy with life. Yeah. Have you come across um, OST before, Objective Strategy and Tactics? No. So this is something which I, which I read about in a book by Lester Campbell, funny, funny so right. he talks about this a lot, where you have your major objective of what you want to, want to achieve, the strategy of how, how you're going to do that. And I think the real important part of it is the tactics and, and how you measure and move those further forward. Yeah. Talk to us about where you've seen these sort of goals that people want to cement into their life really being transformed through the habits and the, you know, the tiny habits they're able to create around it as well. Yeah, sure. There's, a, I think, a mindset shift required first, and you've sort of alluded to this, haven't you? Which is, we tend to think in terms of goals a lot, don't we? Goals and results, and we, and we, when we want to achieve something, we tend to set ourselves a big goal, and we focus on that 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 goal. There's a couple of problems with that. One is that we don't control at least a lot of the things that go into whether we achieve that goal or, or not. So we don't control the outcome. We can't control the outcome. But the other thing is just thinking about the goal and result that we want is inherently stressful. So if we're always thinking about, okay, that project yeah. needs completing or that marathon needs running or you know whatever it is, it can be very stressful thinking about it. And I think what you've described there with, with OST is actually quite similar to what we do in, in Tiny Habits, which is you take a, a goal or an aspiration that you, that you want, but then you break it down into all of the different things that you could do that will contribute to that aspiration or that goal. Mm. You're breaking it down, as you said, into those tactics, but in our language, into individual behaviours that you can do. Because when we break it down into things that we can actually do, it takes the pressure off a bit because we've got something to do. And then we look at that that broad sphere of many, many different behaviours, and we choose the ones that we think are going to be most effective in getting us towards that aspiration. And then we choose the ones that we can do in other words that we've got ability to do and want to do and that's where we start so we've got effective behaviors that we know we're able to do and we know we can do and that gives us a really good place to start and that's how you look at or how you establish which habits you should focus on in the first place and then once you've got that then you can think about how do i make those habits sticky how do i establish them and grow them and accumulate them I think the, there's an interesting piece here, isn't that there around that as well? We talked about this beforehand, and I think this is almost a generational thing about instant gratification and how with digital worlds, we expect things to, to move immediately. But the real world is, is that, that not everything changes straight away. So people will put those steps in place. You take it as, as physical fitness or the gym or whatever, whatever it may be. You go there. Uh, you're not seeing yourself suddenly have the six pack and the uh, and the guns growing and all that sort of stuff straight away and you, and you move off because you haven't got that immediate feedback from it because maybe yeah. everything else that you're putting into that that process doesn't uh, you know happen straight away. Yeah, and I think there's some really interesting psychology around that, even down to you know where people are saying right, take your photographs and look at yourself every you know six weeks into a program and see the transformation and such like that. You know, whilst, as you know, I'm a massive believer in, in process over result, but that feedback is really important. That, that desire to see those things measured and improving is a really significant part to keeping people engaged into the process. You know, if I look at, if I look at something in my business at the moment, it will be around you know, the use of social media, for example. A lot of our outbound business is, or inbound business is based on really strong outbound value being added by content, by social media. To, you know, to find the best talent in the marketplace, we want to have engaged communities of, of, of talent. But if I look at our re a recruiter, as a, for example, they're looking for that instant feedback of a candidate, a CV that they can send out to turn into an interview, to turn into a potential deal. Now, there are quicker ways of short-circuiting it and having that investment of time into your online brand that allows business to come to you. But it yeah. needs consistency in the, the people you're adding to your, to your network. It needs consistency in the quality of outbound planning that you need to do. The, the posting on regular basis. The, you know, this is a classic habit formation, as far as I'm concerned, to allow those things to happen. And it's very, very easy when you're busy to say, I'll get to that, and then it drops off, and all of a sudden, you're three days later, not because you're absolutely lazy, but because you're thinking about instant gratification and because you're trying to do, you're trying to force the result. So I think there's an interesting balance there between managing feedback mm. and uh, and how that comes into the equation through that. How, how you know, people break, I think, because they don't see the wins quick enough so quite quite a lot of the time. 
Is that something you see and how do you manage that? Yeah, it is. And I see it in myself, of course, as, as well. Yeah. One of the important things is trying to redefine what feedback you want. So redefining the success you want to, to see. And so, you know, I'll give you an example on, on meditation. And I've been playing around with this for, for years and at times kind of doubted whether this was ever going to do anything for me or, or not. But it, <laughs> I, I had to be, re, to be honest with myself and said, have I really created a consistent habit around this? Because if I haven't, I can't really judge the results I'm seeing or not seeing. So the first step has to be, am I creating a consistent habit around it? Once I was doing that, and this is obviously you know, one of the key pillars of tiny habits, as we talked about, is you've got to redefine success as the doing of the habit or the doing of the behavior that you know is going to get you the result over time. Exactly. So if you feel successful from doing the behavior itself, from doing the habit, then, well, one is you're more likely to, um, to wire it in much quicker. So you're more likely to make it a consistent habit. But also it takes the focus away from that result and places it on the process or, or behaviors. Now, I tried to take my mind completely off. Am I feeling any different from doing this? Because I knew it wouldn't materialize very quickly over time. And the problem is the problem with, with trying to re redefine success as some result and getting feedback from it, which by the way, I do think is important, but it's we, we've got to think about it a little bit, is that how do you define the time frame and how do you define what the result you're looking for is? Because everything appears within a different time scale, doesn't it? For somebody doing a three-mile run every day is going to produce results in a different way, in a different time frame to a, an, another person. So how do you define what time frame you're looking at for the success? How do you define what time frame you're looking at for that feedback? And what success are you looking for to give you, or what result are you looking for to give you that feedback? That, they're the questions I think you need to be careful about. Because otherwise, you're kind of setting yourself up for a failure and, and stopping the thing, aren't you? So if I was thinking about, okay, in a month's time, I want to be feeling a lot more calm from meditating every day, I'd have just stopped doing it. Because you just yeah. don't see changes that quickly. Whereas I said, I know things are going to happen from this because the evidence is out there that meditation does work. I believe that it works. I've just got to keep doing it. And mm. sure enough, then I did start to see some of the benefits very slowly accumulating over time. So it's, yeah, it, it is a tricky one. I, I agree with you that you need some feedback to, to adjust the, the process, to adjust the behaviors, if you're not quite sure if they're going to lead you where you want to go. If you're sure where those behaviors are going to lead you, believe in the process and kind of stick with it, make it consistent and feel successful from doing the thing itself. There's a very interesting couple of stories that are sort of swelling around in my head as we're talking at the moment. One of which is, is a, a few years ago, we had an event for, for our customers and, and uh, someone who spoke in that was uh, a guy called Steve Backley, who you may remember as the Olympian and javelin thrower, is it? Yeah, he was, was javelin right? thrower, yeah. yeah. So so, uh, so Steve spoke to, about his his journey from with his, with his dad in the back. So he went out to the field out the back of his house and where his journey started was he'd go out and he'd throw his javelin and his dad would sort of put a marker out and say, right, see if you can beat this when he was beating that consistently, you move it back a little bit more and see if you could beat that. And it kept on moving, you know, move the javelin back. So for a long time in this business, we talked a about, are you moving the javelin back? Are you hitting something and then moving it a little bit further? And are you, are you building up your expectations of what's, you know, what's, what's applicable? Yeah. And as you're talking there, even about the sort of three mile run aspect of, of, of what it was, I mean, two years ago, I started running and it was a wheeze around a sort of 2k course and then I bumped into a friend of mine and we started doing it together and both of us you know hadn't done it for you know for a long time you know we started off with, with sort of 5k I remember high five in the five, first 5k that we that we did and all this sort of thing and there was a I remember very vividly sort of being overtaken by a, a sort of 70 year old woman who said who gave us the sort of uh, keep going boys <laughs> aspect as you blitzed into the distance and we we're going this is this is going to be a long journey. But what we did was basically push the javelin back and a 5k run was a 6k run the next week. And then it was a 7k run and it moved all the way forward up to half yeah. marathons. And this year, you know, we're hoping to complete the London Marathon. And I think that's, you know, that's effectively been iterative habits. And if you look at the, you know, the original size of that, it's like, get your stretch done, get your shoes on, and then you're there and, and, and doing, you know, doing that. And I know that, you know, the first part of it sometimes is, just simply putting this, you know, getting the shoes on the hardest part of a run is actually getting changed for it. Yeah. Um, at various yeah. different different points. So I think, you know, when, when we look at that and, and try and 
bring it into all aspects of life. That phase of pushing back the javelin, of just going back that little bit further and that little bit further and that little bit further. Is that something that ties into all this, do you think? It does, but I think progress comes a bit more organically than, than that. Interesting. Again, it, I, I suppose it, you know, part of it is clarifying really what you want to achieve. So in, in this, the, the example that you give, if you want to complete a marathon, it's a very defined outcome. And, and you've got to, in some ways, hit very defined steps along the way. Loads of them. And that, and that, yeah, exactly. And, and that's, <laughs> that's absolutely fine. And, it, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a valid aspiration or, or outcome to, to want. And we know there's a, a sort of tried and tested way of getting to marathon distance. And as you say, you're, you're picking up the, the distance every week and you're doing, you know, maybe some people do some sprint sessions as well. You do some mobility and strength training maybe as well. But we know that that, that distance is going up um, every week. However, it still requires forming habits around it, doesn't it? It still requires putting your shoes on and stepping outside the front door before you can do anything. The problem with having a specific thing, for some people it gets bigger and bigger every day or every week is, there are going to be some days or some weeks when you're just not going to be able to do it because life gets in the way, you're not very well, maybe the weather's not quite how you wanted it to be. Maybe when it comes time for that seven mile run, you don't actually go out at all because I just can't do seven miles today. Whereas if your habits, just getting your shoes on and going out the front door and doing a little bit of running, on the days when you can, that will grow when it can. And on the days when you can't, you should just still feel good about actually going out and doing one mile yeah, or 20 minutes or whatever it happens to be. So I think it, it's quite tricky to tie ourselves to very defined m- milestones. Now, it can work, and a lot of people do make it work, but they make it work for six months because we yeah. can usually sort of really push ourselves with motivation for about six months. And we can do the marathon, but then what? So then you ask the question, why do you want to run a marathon? Do you want to run a marathon just for the sake of running a marathon, or are you using it as a way to get and keep fit? That's interesting. Because if you're using it as a way to get and keep fit, what happens at six months? Yeah. Because presumably the aspiration is not to keep fit for six months. It's to maintain fitness, in which case those very defined distance boundaries are not particularly helpful because you don't build consistent habits around it. So it 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 always starts with... and, and I, you know, it's, it's sort of the three why. So people say, okay, my aspiration is I want to run a marathon. Okay, why? Well, I want to get fit. Okay, why? Because I want to be healthier. Okay, why? Because I want to yeah. be able to ski with my grandchildren or whatever it is. Mm. And once you've clarified what your true aspiration is, it actually changes what you want to do to get there. Mm. Or you might be able to get there in a more efficient and sustainable way. Now, that doesn't mean you, sh- you shouldn't have short-term aspirations like running marathons. That's fine. But is that contributing you to the bigger, you know, the the this week with someone who ran it last year who said never again. And you can see that they, you know, all the program and and obsession they had from that finished that day. And I I think that's a really important aspect as well, isn't it? You don't want to do something, get to your Everest and then, you know, what's next? It's uh, That's right. And that, that's kind of the fallacy of, of, of goals and results, isn't it? It's, It's not that they're not important. They are, they're just not sufficient. We need more than that. And, and so I think it's more helpful to think, you know, really drill into what, what is it you really want and think about the person you want to, to be. I know James Clear talks about this in Atomic, Atomic Habits, doesn't he? Which is, mm. and BJ Fogg talks about it in Tiny Habits as well. Thinking about the person you want to become can be more powerful than thinking about what you want to achieve. So what you want to achieve might be, I want to run a marathon. What you want to be is a marathon runner. Now they're actually, it sounds, it sound, the difference is very subtle, but it's, mm. it is a difference. Because running a marathon is a one-time thing. Being a marathon runner is a lifelong thing. And so to be a marathon runner, you can start to think about just building consistency of running every day. Whereas to run a particular marathon, then you tie yourself into particular distance milestones along the way, don't you? So I think that can be quite helpful as well. And I think in most cases, not all, but in most cases, clarifying what you really want or rather you know the person you want to become and then designing specific habits usually daily habits because they're the the most powerful just like with the toothbrushing example that that we give 
what daily habits are going to contribute most effectively to me getting to that identity or that aspiration? Which ones can I do and which ones do I want to do? And then I just build consistency in doing them. So if I'm out running every day, whether I run for one or five or 15 or seven miles shouldn't matter. They're equally successful mm. on, a, on a given day. The fact is you are becoming a runner. Yeah. As opposed to achieving a one-off thing that then stops. So look at that, I'm a runner now. Right. <laughs> and you are, if you're running on a regular basis and you're building a running habit, you are becoming a runner. Every time you go running, it's a vote for that identity, isn't it? Yeah. I think there's a really interesting thing here. I'm just I'm thinking as, you, as, as you're talking, look, I, I'm going to be really straight here. I think, you know, for a long time, my view of, of, of wellness was, was probably wrapped in bravado of it being, you know, a little woolly and all that sort of stuff and, you know, sort of come and crack on and get on with it. You know, I, I lived yeah. that, that way for a long, you know, for a long, long time my, you know, myself. And, I, and we were talking beforehand about, you know, I, I think there's a huge, there are huge comparisons between business and sport. And I think when we look at sport and we look at the the, the assets, the talent of great sports teams in, in the world, they're looking at every marginal gain they can get by bringing people in there to get their mental game right. That you know, heard Dave Rails would talk about you know, the, the right pillows to get your sleep right and the importance of that, hydration, nutrition, all aspects of it all. And, and, and importantly, that ability to perform at your very best. Last time you were on, we spoke about the sort of massive gains of having people playing at their best during the day for, for longer periods. And the more I've sort of looked at this and lived it to an extent and, and seen it and you know, wanting to create a culture of that in the environment where it is about getting people more regularly playing at their absolute best and in, in exploding performance. This isn't just a sort of nice box ticking exercise. This is a, a major performance breakthrough in terms of the productivity of everyone in your business. And from a more philanthropic basis, making them happier, healthier, and live better and longer along, alongside that as well. We, you know, we talk a lot in this organisation about creating an environment where people are, where their success is inevitable. And I think this becomes an important part of it. I know you've got thoughts around the significance of culture, of environment, around wellbeing strategies and such like. Can you enlighten us a little bit on that? And let me just pick up a, on the, the point that you raised there, which I think is a really good one. And people often misinterpret the, you know, the Dave Brailsford marginal gains, British cycling, Team Sky thing, because they think it's it's directly applicable to everyday life, normal people like you and me mm. in, in business. They were already elite athletes. Mm. They were already, from a, a fitness and health and performance point of view, right up here. Now, in the world of professional cycling, they weren't particularly good at that time, but compared to regular people, they were still elite athletes. So all they could do really was make marginal gains. Yeah. Right? It was all about thinking about the hundreds of different things that they could improve by 1% to make them then better than the, the, the competition. We can all make loads of huge gains in well-being. You know, we don't even need to worry about marginal gains at this point. When we're talking about getting your nutrition and your movement and your sleep working better, those are huge gains. Those are fundamental gains rather than marginal. And once you get those things right, then you can start layering on, you know, the, the, the marginal things, start introducing other things, or in other words, optimizing. But you've got to get the, the basics and the foundations right. And once you do that, you know, that elevates well-being and performance very significantly over quite short periods of time, even if or particularly when, I should say, even though it seems counterintuitive to people, when you're breaking it down and just doing very small things every day. That's what gets you those big gains over fairly short periods of time, not the big one-off, you know, one-off things. Um, so so, so that's the, the point of marginal gains. But environment, and we never got a chance to talk about this last time, so I thought it was a good topic for, for this one. Definitely. The... Your, your physical environment and the, the, the social norms in, your, in which you live have a massive impact on your daily behaviours. You don't realise this, you know, this happening, but we, we kind of intuitively and, and, and intellectually now know this stuff, which is, think about it, your, your physical environment. If your and diet is a very good example of this. If your kitchen looks like the junk food aisle at the supermarket you know your cupboards are full of that stuff and crisps and chocolate and biscuits and your fridge is full of instant meals and you know that your know, processed food 
that's going to form your diet because that's your food environment. If, on the other hand, we take that exact same person and put them in a kitchen which looks like a combination of the greengrocers and the butchers, their diet is going to be completely different without them actually consciously changing their habits because that's what's available, that's what's easy, that's the obvious choice, and it's the path of least resistance. Now, of course, they could drive to the supermarket and pick up a packet of biscuits or a big bag of crisps or whatever, but it's that additional effort required to do that that may stop them doing it. We tend to do things that are in front of us that are obvious and that are easy. So that's, and that applies to, to, to everything. I mean, look, I've got my, I've, I talked to you about this before, didn't I? I'm mean, trying to improve my guitar playing. I've got it right there. Why? Because I've developed a habit of picking up my guitar at a certain point in the morning. Making it obvious means I remember to do it. And having it right there makes it really easy to do, or at least makes it easier to do. So I've redesigned my environment. It might seem small, but it makes that habit more likely to happen every day. And that's even down to where you put your phone as you go to bed or right. all those things as well. Right, exactly. And you can, so you can make things easier for yourself or you can make things harder. So people often, you, this, this came up, I think, in the session we did with you, people often want to, to stop, stop doing bad habits. Mm. Um, the reality is you can never stop a bad habit. It's always going to be wired in there. But what you can do is disrupt it. What you can do is sort of untangle it in a way. And what, a great way of doing that is by modifying your environment. So if you want to stop eating chocolate, for example, don't have it in the house. Yeah. Now, that you're not saying you can never eat chocolate. You can. You can go down to the shop and buy it. Or next time you're at a friend's house and they've got it, you can eat it. And you and you and maybe you should. But if you don't have it in your house, you're very unlikely to eat it when you're at, at home. And as you said, if you put your phone in another room and switch it on silent, you're much less likely to start picking up and scrolling because the cue has gone, the prompt has gone. You don't have the notifications flat or the sounds you know, c- c- coming at you. And it's just not that easy to do. So we can think about, you know, in the, in the workplace, what does the workplace environment look like? Not just in an office now, but what do people's homework environments look like? And how do we help an organization and an individual to redesign that physical environment to make better eat, move and sleep habits more obvious and easier to do? And if we can make them at the path of least resistance, but it's not just physical environment, it's social environment as well. It's the social norms of the organization. And these can be, you know, expectations like you have to be on call till 11 o'clock at night. Or if somebody sends you an email at four o'clock in the morning, the expectation is you respond to it. Or, you know, lots of things around, you know, if somebody puts a, a meeting in your diary without asking you, you have to turn up to that meeting or whatever it is. There are loads of these expectations and social norms that organizations have that influence how people behave, which of course impact their habits around their lifestyle and their and their health if the the social norm is for people to not take a lunch break and grab a quick sandwich to eat at their desk that's very different from giving people a little bit of time to think and and execute on having a good healthy lunch for example yeah Yeah. so you know the question for organizations is one you know make sure companies understand the power of the physical and social environment on people's well-being. Um, secondly, how do you identify the, the problematic environmental cues and social norms that are working against people adopting healthier habits? And how do you make some changes to that, but being cognizant of the business needs? So it's not about, okay, how do we make make an investment bank look like a Buddhist monastery, right? It's not, of course, it's not that. They've got certain business objectives they need to meet. They've got certain ways of working that have to happen sometimes. But how do we disrupt that to say, how do we maintain the ways of working that you need? How do we maintain the objectives you need to achieve from a business point of view? But can we change the environment and the social norms such that your employees are more likely to develop healthier habits? and therefore improve their well-being and therefore improve the performance of the whole, the whole company. And it, so, so if you can do that, you not only help the people that want to make changes, the people that want to eat better, the people that want to do more exercise, the people that want to get better sleep, 
but you also nudge everybody else in the right direction because of the power of the environment and the and the culture. Even the people that have no interest in changing, you yeah. start to change how they behave just by dint of having a, a, a different physical and social environment. Incredible power of the crowd, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they don't have to be big changes. You know, people are often scared, oh, you're going to come and disrupt our culture. That sounds quite frightening. No, no, this is can be quite small, subtle changes that don't don't affect what you need to achieve as a as a business, and actually ultimately ultimately improve it because you get a, a a healthier, more productive, better performing you know workforce. That's where we want to be, James. I could be talking about. I can't believe how quickly time's gone. I could be talking about this for <laughs> for hours and hours and hours with you. Uh, and I think it's fascinating. And we we said beforehand that we wouldn't be short of conversation in this. We did. And, uh, we did. We, we were we, we were thumbs up on it, uh, James. Look, look, one one last thing I want to do before we before we round up. I know that you did a session for us talking at Tiny Habits, which was massively well received. And for people watching, I can tell you that the feedback from everyone on the team who were involved in that has been outstanding. It was a brilliant session and added real value to you know, to us as a business. I know you've got an offer for people who are watching as well. Yeah, I have so for, yeah, for everybody watching, all of the the, the, the fintech and, and and other other companies out there, I'd like to offer each company um, a free. Uh, habits workshop it's a it's an hour-long workshop for 10 people i do it via zoom and it's a really good introduction to to habit change and gives people some really valuable tools to take away to start to apply and it, it doesn't you know it can be about well-being it can be about productivity or, or anything else and effectively what we do in that workshop is people take a habit they want to do and we help them uh, establish it and make it stick uh, and, and in doing that, help them learn the skills, these sort of introductory skills of habit change that they can then apply to uh, to any other aspect of their, their, their life. So you can contact me at james at biome-wellbeing.com or you can find me on, on LinkedIn. Just look for Biome Wellbeing or, or James Gorman and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find me. But please take me up on that. Free Habits Workshop, 60 Minutes, the 10 people uh, on Zoom. And I can tell you, I'll advocate that, that it's, it is uh, absolutely brilliant and well worth everyone doing. It's incredibly generous for you, James, and thanks for doing that. I'm sure it's going to add some real value to people as well. Real pleasure. So, Bye. James Gorman, thank you for joining us. Uh, pleasure as always. Toby, thanks once again, and I, uh, I look forward to coming back. Looking forward to it. Thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot. Hello.